in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to take you on a journey of the development of a bionic eye, the type of work that we've been doing in Bionic Vision Australia. But first of all, I want you to imagine that your eyesight's failing. In five years, you'll be legally blind. In 10 years, you'll have no useful vision. And the real tragedy is that in 20 years' time, your child's vision will begin to fail. This is a situation for patients that suffer from retinitis pigmentosa. It's an inherited uh, blindness, a pathology of, of the retina. 1.5 million patients around the world suffer from retinitis pigmentosa. 25% of these patients are legally blind. This is a patient group that we hope to treat with a bionic eye. The eye is a remarkable structure. It is encased by a fairly leather-type structure called the sclera, the white in, uh, around the side of the eye. The most amazing part of the eye, of course, is, is the retina, that specialised tissue structure at the back of the eye that contains photoreceptor cells that convert light into nerve impulses. And then the retinal ganglion cells, the nerves of the retina, that take that information and send it via the optic nerve to our visual cortex where we perceive our visual field. It's that retina that gets damaged in retinitis pigmentosa and other forms of, of retinal pathology. So the image you see now is a histological image of a, of, of a, re, of a retina. The blood supply, the retina being, is a very metabolically active structure, and the sclera, the leather bag that contains the, the, the eye structures together. The retina, as I said before, contains the photoreceptor cells, and these cells are very, very susceptible to a variety of different pathologies. When they're destroyed, they don't, there's no capability of regeneration. So a patient cannot then see again. But most importantly, from a prosthetic point of view, the retinal ganglion cells, the neurons that are driven by these photoreceptors, are still surviving. And that's the tissue that we will use with our retinal prosthesis to artificially stimulate the retinal ganglion cells, as we do in a cochlear implant by artificially electrically stimulating the auditory nerves. So this is a video of how we see a modern bionic eye. We haven't built all the components of this yet, but the patient will wear glasses with a video camera, have a visual pros uh, processor, that will analyse the visual scenes of the, of, of the world and map those onto a particular electrode array. Like a cochlear implant, that information will be transmitted across the skin using wireless technology to an implantable stimulator. That stimulator will be very much like the type of stimulator that Sue is wearing with a cochlear implant. That stimulator will set up very, very fine current pulses, tiny current pulses, that are transmitted along that cable to electrode arrays that are implanted close to the surviving visual nerves, the retinal ganglion nerves. And it's our task to make sure we can stimulate those safely and in a very organised manner to provide visual information to these blind patients. So this project is based on two phases. The first phase is we're developing an electrode array with 100 electrodes. So that's a, that's a significant technological leap. The cochlear implant has 22 electrodes, so we're multiplying the complexity by five. But most importantly, for this type of device, we're using materials that have a long history of safe application in long-term implantation. We're using platinum electrodes and we're using medical grade silicon, the same materials that are used in cochlear implants. These electrodes are in a planar fashion and we've been working significantly because as Gordon said before in his talk, all this work has to be done in multidisciplinary groups. 
So we've been working very, very closely with retinal surgeons to develop a safe, effective way to perform the surgery to insert these electrodes. So the technique is to put a small incision in the sclera and then create a tissue pocket between the sclera and those blood vessels that um, feed the, the retina. And then the planar electrode slides down that tissue pocket to the back of the eye. The sclera is sutured up, leaving the only thing that's exiting from the eye, a lead wire that goes back to the implantable stimulator. Mechanical stability is a, a major issue for prosthetic devices. We don't want our electrodes moving around with movement of the eye. We don't want our electrodes in cochlear implants to be moving. If our electrodes are moving, they're stimulating one nerve neural population one day and another neural population another day. That would be terribly confusing. We're very fortunate with, with doing the, um, this work in the eye in that we can actually look into the eye and image the eye and see the electrode in the back of the eye. And that's the image you see at the moment, where, where the planar electrode underneath the retina you can see the outline clearly, the optic nerve, the optic disc, and the, the beautiful vasculature of the, of the retina. And we know that with chronic implantation, these electrodes stay very mechanically stable. So the surgery is safe, and the electrodes are mechanically stable, two key ingredients for a successful uh, clinical bionics device. Not surprisingly, because of a of the type of materials we selected, when we implant these materials long term in the eye we, and, and we evaluate them histologically, we see good, very good biocompatibility. So in this image you can see the location of the electrode in the inset. That electrode had to be removed because we can't section platinum wires. But you can see the position of the um, optic nerve in, in, in the low uh, power image. Um, but most importantly, we see very, very little tissue, adverse tissue response. And the key was that we see adjacent to the electrode no adverse changes to the retina, which is a very, very delicate structure. That's very important because, of course, that's, they're the cells that we want to stimulate with our bionic eye. So these devices have safe surgery, they're mechanically stable, and they're biocompatible over long-term implantation. The second phase of our work, and this is a little bit more blue sky, but the second phase of our work is working with the, our colleagues at Melbourne University in the physics department to develop um, conductive diamond electrodes where we can increase the density not to 100 electrodes but to 1,000 electrodes over a very small surface area of less than um, 4 by 4 millimetres. And these are images of, our con of the conductive diamond electrodes. We can't put that hard, rigid, conductive diamond electrode at the back of the eye with the curvature. What we're going to do, however, is put the surface of, the, uh, of those conductive diamonds on the front surface of the retina, right next to the retinal ganglion cells. And to do that, we need to put the, um, the conductive diamond on a silicon substrate and then use retinal tacks to tack into the retina. Now, that sounds pretty uh, serious type of surgery, but the retinal tack surgery has been used for very many years in retinal surgery to reattached, attached retinas. So for a retinal surgeon, this is not a, a major step. This type of device with a thousand electrodes would then have a lead wire coming out of the sclera and again feeding back to a stimulator that's implanted at the back of the, back of the head. We've in fact done this work now in, in living eyes and you can see that, that silver um, uh, high density diamond electrode array with a tack in the back of a retina, and you can also see the, the, the optic nerve. So surgically, this technology is feasible, and we're just commencing long-term chronic biosafety studies using this technology. 
developing these sorts of prosthetic devices is not all high-powered electrophysiology and uh, material science. It's also some of the really basic aspects of, of making sure things like cables don't break. So this image shows a receiver stimulator and the cable system that goes to connect the 100 electrodes that are um, part of the bionic eye electrode array. Those 100 cables are, in fact, very, very thin platinum iridium wires that are less than the diameter of a human hair. They are connecting to an electrode which we know is mechanically stable. But our big issue, though, was the associated with eye movement. Eye movement is a, a major issue for us because 150,000 eye movements a day is the average number of eye movements we normally sighted people have. And in fact, if you read papers, we'll also find that a blind patient also has 150,000 micro and macro saccades each day. And we've got to make sure that our electrode system that's delivering these current pulses to, to the retinal ganglion cells does not undergo significant metal fatigue with years and years of implantation with 150,000 eye movements each day. So we do things like this. We set up fairly simple rigs where we mimic the surgery, the, the implant, the lead wire, and we rotate and we rotate and we rotate. This particular eye has been rotating since before Christmas. Not one of the uh, 100 lead wires in this lead wire have, have broken, uh, and it's undergone more than 20 million rotations, mimicking macro saccades. So it's, it's, it's these very practical issues that also have to be addressed when we're developing these devices for clinical application. So what can we expect a patient using a bionic eye to see? Well, with a single electrode, we can control current and make the device brighter and smaller. We can use greater number of electrodes and provide a patient with small numbers of electrodes, up to 100, with a technique that will allow them to move. But once we get to 1,000 electrodes, we believe that we can have a device that will allow patients to read uh, large font print. So there's still a large amount of work to be done to develop this technology, but I can guarantee that we will have a small clinical trial in less than a year. So I'd like to acknowledge all our colleagues in Bionic Vision Australia. I'd like to acknowledge, of course, the, the funding from Australian Research Council. I'd like to particularly acknowledge the young people in, that have to work in a multidisciplinary environment. Sometimes working in a multidisciplinary environment is not easy. But it's creating that culture that's so important to make sure that together the disciplines can contribute to the final end product. And, uh, and working and teaching with the next generation of people that will develop devices that I and many of us in the room haven't even thought about. That's a real pleasure for us. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the plastic brain. I think listening to Sue's talk, we heard a lot already about the plastic brain. But as engineers, physiologists, uh, technicians, we know that these devices, although remarkable, are in fact presenting a fairly crude biological signal to the hearing nerve, to the visual nerve, or to other uh, sensory nerves. Provided we provide a biologically relevant signal, the plastic brain will do the heavy lifting and do the interpreting that makes these devices so successful. Thank you very much.